So <clears throat> all these operators that we've been talking about with add, uh, multiply, divide, um, and also the functions and or anything that is a binary operation, it takes two, uh, two operands, they're what are called universal functions in, in NumPy. And so they have this extra set of methods on them. So if we look over here on add, you know, you might think uh, add is what's called a u-func, and you, you can take a, a, we have our array here, add a comma a, it's going to add those two values together. That's exactly the same thing that happens if you take a plus a. But also, if we look here, there are all these strange little methods here, and I'm going to talk about four of them. Um, this accumulate method, this reduce method, reduce at, we won't talk about that too much, but outer. So those four methods are special methods that, that are available on these operations. And so here's what they do. Uh, the reduce operation, and this takes the operation, think about it, uh, add is an easy one to think about. Add.reduce, if you like math, then you can look at, at the formula here and see what it does. It's just a summation of all the elements uh, in, in that uh, array A. Add takes two arrays and adds them together, or it can do a reduction on a single array by doing an element, adding all the elements together uh, individually. So add.reduce of A adds those together, but look what happens if you have a, uh, it works on list as well, and these universal functions work uh, on any sequence and they're going to try to do a reduction of those elements by performing the add operation. So here we have strings. A is a list of strings, and if we do the reduce, you remember that if you added strings together, it was a concatenation operation. So we're taking our A, B, C, D, E, F, and squeezing them together into a single form of single string. There's also logical operations, so you can do a logical and. Uh, reduction, and that's the same thing as doing a uh, all operation, right? All values being one. And a logical or dot reduce is going to be the same thing as the any function that we saw earlier. So reductions, if you define your own u func that takes a binary operation, uh, then you can add these methods as well, and they'll work on individual arrays doing the reduction. And it's called a reduction because it takes an array of n dimensions and, and, and returns an array that's n minus one dimensions. It's a reduction along some dimension. All right, so uh, if we just do this, if I, I'll create an array here, a equal a range, or let's do 20, a dot shape. We'll reshape this guy where it's equal to uh, 4 by 5, so we have that, and if we do add.reduce a, then the default behavior then you see is a summing along the columns here. It, it's a reduction along this axis. If we spent uh, along the row axis, if we specify axis equal negative 1, the last axis is the column axis, we'll reduce all of those down. and. Uh, and now we've reduced 1, 2, 3, 4 is added, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is added to 10. So visually, if you look at these, you can look at it this way. It's just uh, the reductions either occur along the columns or along the row, or uh, you're summing up the columns, which is a reduction actually along the rows. You're reducing all the rows to one row, or you're reducing all the columns to a single column. So there's an accumulation operation as well, and this is very similar. Uh, the only difference is, you noticed, we did this, these are a reduction operation, right? We're reducing the, the number of values. It's almost as if we're going along when we have our array here, 1 plus 2 is equal to uh, 3, but then we immediately add 3 to 3, that's 6, and we throw away the fact that 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. Well, a lot of times you want to keep up with that. You want to keep a running sum uh, of, well, what, what happens if I just add the 1 to the 2? Well, that's what accumulation does. Accumulation is not a reduction. Your array is exactly the same size. 
as the previous array. And so here we have uh, accumulate one, one in itself, I mean one plus nothing, which is what you originally had is one, and then one plus two is three, then that three plus this three is six. So we're accumulating and keeping those values in the location where the element was before. All right, and you can do the add accumulate with strings just as well. Uh, you, you sit here and you add those up and you get the accumulation. AB by itself is the first value. AB accumulated with CD is that string. And now you accumulate them all and that becomes your third string here. In the string, oh, the O. That, so that's um, an artifact from these slides originally being developed for numeric. So this should actually be, and we can sit here and do it. Uh, if we do this actually, let's do it and you can see. Thank you for catching that. A, B, C, D, E, F. Now if I do add dot accumulate A. What's that? Oh, maybe I need to. I would have thought that worked, but we'll do. So, huh, that's interesting. So it's changed, uh, it has changed since uh, from NumPy, numeric to NumPy. That actually looks like a, uh, a bug to me. So you can see what it's doing, it's actually accumulating from the other direction, right? It's, it's adding, instead of pre-adding, it's post-adding. So logical ops that work the same way, it's just doing a logical accumulation uh, uh, along the way uh, of ands or ors as it may be. Uh, if you use op.outer, this is going to take the outer, uh, we usually think about outer products, right? But it's the outer operation. And so here, uh, if we do add.outer a comma b, then you can see what happens. It's almost as if A gets turned down this axis and B is along this axis and then we add the row element out of this row to each element uh, in B. So we have the zeroth element of A added to B0 and then to B1 and then to B2 and the same uh, for this row. And you'll note that outer products uh, order matters, right? And so we add a comma B here, and uh, if we do B comma A, then we're going to end up with a different shaped array as the output uh, and different results, obviously, as well. So all of those functions are available and you can use them. We obviously have talked about, okay, well, let's move on to uh, a few more functions for doing selections out of an array. And this is a slide that it's almost better if you just look at it and I don't say anything. I don't think that's quite true, but it seems that way. This is a really funny function. It's called choose. And as you look at it, you may wonder why the heck do they even bother to have this function, but I'll show you why in just a minute in an example. Okay, so we have the choice array here. We have the function choose and it, the first argument is this choice array and then as a second argument, we give a list of arrays that are basically what we're going to choose values out of. And so here's how it works. In the cho choice array, we have two things that are important. There's the value of an element in the choice array, and there's the position that it's in in that array. So we have this choice array, 0, 0, 0. Well, what happens here is this index is saying, I want to choose from array C0, the zeroth index element in this list of values. So it's going to pull this zero right here and copy it down into Y. And now we come down and we say, well, we have another choice. Or choice. We, want to, we again want to choose from C0, but notice when we copy a value down, we copy the value out of the same location as this array. And the same if we come along, and same for this one. So 0, 1, 2 go across the top row. And now the one is selected out of this C1 array. And again, it's going to pick whichever element. These are all the same elements, so, or the same value. But it pulled that five and stuck it down here. Two pulls from here. 
And then you can also just stick a scalar in if you want to. And so now position doesn't matter, right? It's just saying if you have a three over here, it's always going to choose nine and copy it into your output array. So now we have uh, uh, nines in this little section because of these threes. Does that make sense? Now the question is, why do you care, right? I mean, why would you ever do this? And the answer is we talked about clip a few minutes ago, right? So how do you implement clip? Well, you can do it in C, but you can also just write a simple function in Python. So what would that function look like? Well, let's see how you might do this. We have our original array, <clears throat> has a set of values, and then I, this is equivalent of saying A less than 10, right? I'm just, if I have A, what does my array look like? See, A equals A range 25. A dot shape. Oh, I didn't. That's good enough. Let's do. All right. So I have my array here, and I can either do less A and say 4, less a 4, and that's going to return all the values that are less than 4, or I can do a less than 4, which is probably a little prettier mathematically, but I've chosen to use the less here, and I've created an array that's basically this mask, right? We're using ones here instead of true-false, but the same, same basic purpose. All right, so what would happen if I then come in and say, okay, I've created this mask, I want to use this array that I just created. I want to use this array that I just created as my choice array. And so these become indexes, right? Zero and one are my indexes into A and into 10, or into this array. So anywhere there's a zero here, we're going to choose a value out of A. Anywhere where there's a one, we're just going to choose 10. And if you look down here, look what happens. Anywhere where we were less than 10, the values are 10. Anywhere we're not less than 10, we just get our old values. Kind of a nice behavior. Well, if you want to expand this to actually handle clip, we got to clip at the lower end and at the upper end, right? So how do we do that? We have to, we're creating indices that we have, and so we have our less than array that we had. If we want greater than 15, we create another greater than array. And then we need to do a little math here because these greater thans are just going to be one zero values. Well, we want, uh, what we can do is multiply those by two. And this is going to create this array that you see here where we had the same ones that we had on the less than, but wherever there were greater thans, we now have two because we multiplied those times two. And then we have zeros in the middle. Now you use that as your index, and now you have a comma 10 comma 15, you've clipped it at both the low end and at the high end. So this is starting, you start getting a feeling uh, of, uh, if you're not a MATLAB user, which some of you I know are, but if you're used to writing Fortran and C, um, there's a bit of a change. You're not thinking about for loops anymore, right? everything starts happening in these vector operations. You have to think about things, how do I, how do I uh, create vectors that represent these things, uh, you know, the, the, the operations I want to do, and use special indexing or use these choice operators or use these uh, clipping tools, all of these different things uh, instead of thinking for loops. That's how we think in the C and the Fortran world. So when you go to the lab today, hint, hint, when you sit down to do exercises, starting with the for loop is probably not the answer. All of the examples, I want you to think about indexing. All right, so uh, where, I had mentioned earlier, we talked, of, there was a where function version one that I showed you. This is the version two, and, and the slides here almost just for the purpose of, uh, documentation or whatever so you can look at it. There's no difference between how this where works really and the choice array before. It's just a simple version that only allows you to have a false and a true value here. So your condition, if you know, if you have zeros and ones, the first array that you pass in is the false, the second array is the true, 
and you're getting the same kind of behavior as the choice. Where, I don't use this very much, I always use the choice array and whenever I use the where, I'm using the first version that just takes a single argument uh, and, and returns to you the indices of where that argument was true. Remember, if we do where, if we have A equals A range 10 and I do a where, and so A is that, and if I do a where, A is greater than 5, then it just gives you back the indices. On the other hand, you can use it in this way where you pass in three arguments, where I just passed in a single argument here, and you have this, uh, this functional behavior. We talked about concatenate. We showed a few other methods um, that are maybe simpler. Uh, concatenate's there, and you can use it if you, if you uh, would like. Uh, x comma y, if you want to concatenate two arrays together, they have to be, it takes a list or a sequence of arrays as its argument. But when you concatenate x comma y, it def defaults to concatenating uh, along the zeroth axis. And so that's the row axis, and so it concatenates those together. If you want to concatenate along the first axis or the column axis in two dimensions, then you just specify as the second argument axis equal one. Now, if you want to stack these things in a third dimension, then the way that you do that is just using the standard array uh, function, conversion, and if you just put those elements in a, uh, two, in a tuple or any kind of sequence, then the default behavior, I mean, the way that the nesting occurs is to concatenate those along another dimension. So all of those work. All right, so broadcasting. This is a really cool feature uh, in, in NumPy, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. Uh, and uh, once you learn it, it also takes a little restraint not to use it too much. So we'll point that out in a few minutes. But here's an example. We've already talked about what happens if I have two arrays that are the same shape. In this case, we have 4 by 3 plus a 4 by 3. And we're just adding the elements together. So this array, or this operation here, is just duplication of that one. There's no difference. Well, what happens, though, if you come along and you have a 4 by 3 and you add it through an array that just has a one-dimensional array that has three elements? Well, one of, the, one of the choices would be it fails. It won't allow you to do that. Python actually does something slightly different. It's called a broadcast operation. And so what it does is it says, ah, I noticed that the last two dimensions of these arrays match. They're both three. So then I'll take the elements here and add each of the elements here into the elements on this row as well as this row, uh, as well as this row. So it's as if it stretched these values down this array or down this dimension, and then it just added those to each of the rows. And so this happens to be equivalent to this up here. But you haven't had to duplicate uh, all of these values, right, uh, on this one. Well, what if you come along and instead of having a 4 by 3, you have a 4 by 1 matrix and you add that to this 3 uh, element array? Well, the last dimensions don't match, do they? So uh, it doesn't quite follow this rule, but there's a second rule in broadcasting and that is if either of the uh, dimensions are one, then, that, uh, then the broadcast matches. And what it does is it stretches that one to be the same size as this one. So what happens here is you have two stretching operations where you've duplicated these values across, and you've duplicated these values down, and then you add them together, and you end up with this array. And so you'll notice what operation is this? We had the add dot outer. It's the same thing. If you don't want to put add dot outer in the middle of your equation, you can have arrays that are like this uh, and use broadcasting, and your math still looks kind of pretty and clean as you're writing out your equations. Uh, and you haven't also, this is kind of painful if you have to create, you know, in the end, you just want this array, right? This is 2D, it might be big, it might be a zillion by a zillion in, in rows and columns, 
just to do the operation of creating this array, I don't want to have to create two more arrays that are, you know, now you have two, a zillion by a zillion, you have three zillion by a zillion matrices here, right? Instead of having one. And you could do it just with one uh, vector here and one vector here. So it's much more efficient uh, memory-wise to do this. So that's a handy trick. Now, Python doesn't try to be too smart about things. It doesn't go, ah, I noticed you have a four by three and I see a four and I could take this array, uh, this uh, vector and broadcast it down this way and that would work. There's a mismatch here because the three, it's not going to try to match this four with this four. This three and this four don't match. And so because of that, it's going to return to you a, a frames not aligned error. If you actually want to use this, this brings out two things. You remember we talked a little earlier about indexing with none, and that looked a little strange. Why would you ever care to do that? Well, this is why you might want to do that, right? You can take two arrays that you just create in a normal way, A and B, and then uh, you, you ask for A to have all of its values put along the rows, add an extra column that creates this, or just basically turns that array on its head, and then you add that to your original B, and you end up with this array. So, that's a lesson in how to do broadcasting. I'll show you an example of where you might do it, and then show you why this was a bad idea. So, um, here's a problem set, a and this one is, is how many people are, are uh, in information theory? So there are a few people. Okay, so uh, vector quantization is one of the typical algorithms that you might do to try to do classification on objects or whatever else. You might imagine that you have a set of, um, of any, any attributes that you might imagine. Each of these elements here is a sample and you have feature one and feature two, and they could be any feature. I mean, if you're looking at basketball players, those features might be their height and, and their arm span or something like that plotted against each other. And what you've learned is that people that are in this category, if they're in zero or three, way, or people up here tend to be good, people down here tend to be bad. Uh, that doesn't quite work with the attributes that I gave there, but, but you, can, you can have a, uh, an idea uh, of, of wanting to be able to separate, if you have this large population, wanting to be able to separate them into two groups. Well, the notion of vector quantization, what you do is say, you know, people that are close to zero and three are in one class, people that are close to one, two, and four are in another class. And so to be able to pull that off, what you have to be able to do is calculate the distance from each of these elements to all of those individual codes, or what we call them, and find out which one's the minimum distance. So let's look at this. If you imagine you take one of your, your observations or your basketball players, one of your data points, if you want to know which, uh, which code does this item belong to, you have to calculate its distance to all of the codes that you've defined and then this one's the minimum distance, so this one falls in the category of one. And then basically you have categories one, two, and four are good, zero and three are bad, or one is one target, one is another target. Any of these kind of ideas. Does that make sense to people? All right, so how would you do this? Well, say you have a new data set. You know, you've trained this. You kind of created this data set based on a training data set or created your codes, positioned them based on a training data set. Now you get a whole lot, uh, you, you know, you go to, you have a no, uh, maybe basketball is the wrong example here, right? I should be using cricket, I guess. So you have a whole new set of cricket players come in. You want to find out who's good and who's bad. And so now you just need to classify them based on these features. Well, how do you do it? Well, you have two things. You have all these observations in here, these gray dots, and you have your codes. And you can, if you organize these, you might organize them in this way. You have your set of observations. Here, I've done three dimensions instead of two. You know, this is X and Y. But you can do this in the N dimensions. It doesn't matter how many dimensions you have. So here we have X, Y, and Z. So each of these is an observation. 
or each of these is, is a measurement that you've made uh, on a specific observation. So observation zero has this x value, this y value, and this z value. And you have that duplicated over and over again. So you have a thousand new players. In this case, we have 10 new players. Uh, and then you have your codes that you trained originally to determine uh, which, uh, uh, which class somebody was in. C0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So how do you do the math of this? Well, the first thing we need to do is take a difference, right? So what we can do is take these, col or these arrays. There are two arrays here. And we can turn one this way and one this way. And now that's done with this indexing process of none co uh, colon. And we've, we've, we've added one zero dimension uh, in the depth dimension. It has one. And then we just turn the 10 and 3. Oh, excuse me. That's this. We've, we've added one dimension uh, and then put the 10 along the rows and the 3 along the columns here. Done the same with the other one. And now when we add them, we end up with this cube in the middle, or subtract them, excuse me, we add, end up with this cube. And each of these is the difference between the code elements. If you look here, this is going to be observation zero. This row right here is going to be the difference between observation zero and code zero. This is observation zero minus code one and code two all the way down. And so once we've done that, one of these is really the difference, the distance from the vector. So what we can do is we can square that value and what we're going to want to do is compress it along that, uh, the depth axis here so that we get the distance value. Now this value is going to be the distance of observation zero from code zero. This is the distance from, observa or from observation zero from code one and on down the way. And what we need to do then is find out which one is the min. So you do arg min, and uh, along the zeroth axis, it compresses. Which one of these is the lowest one? And that's going to give us the index. So object zero now, this will say either zero, one, two, three, or four in that place. And we've reduced this actually fairly complicated algorithm into a fairly short amount of code. So this is really cool, right? I'm going to show you how fantastic this is. All right, so how fast does it run? Well, so here's the MATLAB version of it, and that really fancy thing that I, MATLAB doesn't have this notion of being able to do broadcasting. So we ought to be better, right? Well, it doesn't look so good here, right? We have a speed up of 0.71. Usually you want speed ups greater than one. Speed up of 0.71 means you're slower. So that's not a good thing. So we just ran slower. If we go to floating point types, we do a little bit better. You know, float 32s are a little more efficient than float 64. We're still not much of a speed up. So why? What went wrong here? Here's the problem. If you look at this, I start with this data, right? And really what I want is this data. Well, in between here, what have I done? I've created this massive 3D array. In, as an intermediate step. And I'm just going to throw that thing away. So the allocating this 3D array just is killing me. It's sucking up all the time. And so this is the, this is the don't be too clever with broadcasting is the, 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 um, the moral of this story. Because if you are, then you end up with vectors that are much larger than the pre original vectors. And especially if you're reducing back down, you can kill yourself on speed. And so I took a second approach to this. If you look at this, you can say, well, maybe I don't want to broadcast and create this 3D array. I'll just do the broadcasting on a code by, or an observation by observation basis. So I'll turn this, instead of taking this whole row, I'll just take uh, just this one element, just this one observation, multiply it here. And so then I'm just getting 2D slabs instead of this 3D slab, and I kind of walk through the array like this, right? And I can do that. And that's, that's a good idea. That's, that solves some of our memory problem. And we almost get back up to the speed to the MATLAB version in here. Uh, and uh, it's uh, for floating point values. Uh, it's still better, but we're, it's still not that great. And so this is kind of to whet your appetite for tomorrow. If you just go back and go, listen, I know how to write this little algorithm. It's only about 10 lines. I'm going to write this in C. 
How fast does it go? Well, it goes fairly fast. You get a factor of 25 speed up over the MATLAB version. So the nice thing is you can do it. You can write a quick algorithm in Python and get it working. And you can test all your code and do that sort of thing. And, and then when you need to, you can switch over and write your little algorithm in C that you need, link that in. These algorithms, by the way, are now, uh, if you look in the, um, I think there's a cluster uh, module in SciPy. And so we use, these are the vector quantization methods that are in that cluster uh, library. So if you're doing this in your information theory stuff, don't write your own, just use these. They're already blazingly fast. Pickling, you didn't talk about pickling yesterday at all. Okay, uh, quickly. So there's this notion in uh, programming or in, in many languages of serialization. And so if you have an object, A, and you need to store it out, the state that it's in on the disk or send it over a, uh, uh, the network uh, through a TCP IP or whatever it is, then uh, you need to get some representation of that object state, right? Well, serialization is the common word for doing that. You're going to take this object state, its memory, and serialize it out, write it out in some format that can then be interpreted in the future or some at a different location where you can reconstitute your object and be able to manipulate it again. So Python has a serialization method called pickling. And, you know, the, the reference here is you're saving it out, right? And so, and it, to, they further it by the module that you use if you're pickling things and storing them out is the shelf module. So you store your pickles on your shelves. Uh, well, Python, uh, there, there are multiple different notions uh, of pickling. You can either pickle out to an ASCII format or you can pickle out to binary formats. And there are actually two binary formats. So, uh, there's the old version and the new version. Um, the, the point here is when you're storing out your arrays, be careful about what you're doing or pay a little attention. If you, if you make sure that you store out, the default is to store out in ASCII. And you can see what happens here. We have a, an array of zeros here. It's 40,000 bytes long. Dump S will allow us to, that just pickles the array to a string. So now we have this ASCII representation of our, of our array but look how long it is. It's 160,000. So you had a 4x ballooning, and that's because it's having to write out the characters that represent that floating point number instead of just storing the, the four bytes of the floating point number, or the, uh, uh, in, 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 yeah, in this case, four bytes of the floating point number. It has to write out a lot of characters. You know, 8.4321E negative 16, or whatever it is, negative 10. So, you, it explodes in size. On the other hand, if you pick a line in the binary format, you can see it's very compact. It's almost exactly the same size. It just has the little extra information we talked about, about having to store out the header information about how the array is organized. So be careful about that. So controlling the output format, you'll notice if I do on an array, if I do A is equal to array, and I make this 0, 1, 2, 1 e to the negative 6. When I print that out, it prints out a whole lot of digits here, right, uh, on these things. And so what you can do is come in and there's a set print options flag that you can set up so that a lot of times it's pretty hard to read this. It takes up a lot of space and you can't really tell if that's a zero or not and, and that sort of thing. So if you want to control that, you can set the precision. This will show how many digits it's going to show uh, out of the floating point numbers. Uh, the other thing is that you can, you can set the threshold. If I have an array that's 100 elements long and I ask to print it, it prints it for me. If I come in, though, and I give it an, ele uh, an array, I think 1,000, it will, it prints all of those as well. But as soon as I put 1,001 elements in my array. So there's a threshold that's been set. At some point, you can't watch all of that stuff streaming by and make any sense of it, right? 
And so you just want to see a representation of what my array is, especially if it's a gigabyte. And then you're just, you know, you've, you're just waiting half the day for it to stream by. And that actually used to be a problem. It would actually, IPython would lock as it sat there and streamed all million elements by you. Um, so there's also the ability to suppress really small floating point values. So if we come in and A is equal to array, and we do 0, 2, 3, 1, e to the negative 15. So that's a pretty small value. If we do uh, set print options suppress equal true, Now it doesn't print out that teeny, teeny value. It just says, ah, oh, that must have been a zero. I'm not sure where the threshold flag is set, but it's, it's um, on floating point values, it's probably down at 10 to the negative 14 or so. I mean, on double precision. So that's kind of a handy feature. So you can tweak these however you want to get the output that you need. Uh, there's some examples right quick. I think we've walked through those. There's also... Um, Error handling. And what I'm going to do is I'll leave that for you to, to look at. This is just explaining about floating point errors. If you have, uh, um, you know, when you, you do floating point operations, you can have overflow and underflow. How is that handled? By default, uh, NumPy warns about it, but you can set it where it throws errors whenever it sees a NAND or all of these different things. Uh, so what I, the reason I went through that quickly is I, I do want to talk about composite data structures, uh, if only in a very small uh, way here. So we've, we've said that arrays have a D type, and it's usually been float32 or float64 or something like that. Uh, but a lot of instruments, especially uh, things like the Hubble, uh, for example, when they stream data back, the data that comes back from an instrument isn't just an array of values. It may be an array that has the first four bytes are a floating point value, the next byte is an uh, unsigned integer value, and then the next uh, three bytes are a string. You know, it's a very complex data type that comes in in memory. Well, Python allows you to find data types or D types that actually describe a block of memory in a more interesting way. It doesn't, you don't have to say it's all floating point. And so what you do in a D type is you, display, you describe how an element, what is the packing of an element. And here in this case, what I've done is I've described a D type where the first element I'm saying is a float a uh, 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 four element or a four byte floating point number and the second element is a four uh, byte floating point number and both of them have uh, names. We're naming the first one mass and the second one velocity. So I can create a particle here equal to this array and we created this and I've specified the, the data type to be a particle type. So what happens here is these values are the masses and these values are the velocities in the description of how this is put together. And you don't have to do this through Python, right? This can be reading a data structure in that's a C data structure and this actually specifies how it, it will treat the individual bytes in this. So um, I'm going to, all right, so we created our D type. Cut and paste didn't work very well. And then I'll create a particle and this is a nested array, a list of lists, and one, one, I'm going to make another particle here, two, one, and then a third one that's two, three, and then spent my D type to be particle type. Save that as A. Uh, array. We'll make that our particles. I 
may have to do. All right, not sure why it doesn't take a list, but it doesn't. So there's our array. And now I can index into this. If I ask for a particle uh, zero, I grab the particle zero and it gives me both of those elements back. But I can also do this, which is kind of cool. And that just gives me the masses of that array. So it treats those as if they're fields. This becomes really, really powerful when you start thinking about a database. This is nothing more than a database table. But you have it in memory. You have all these slice operations. You have all these reduction methods. You have all of these capabilities. So instead of having to do all your operations in SQL, uh, you can, uh, on, the, uh, on the server side, you can select out your data set that you want, put it in one of these tables, and then go to town doing all kinds of math and slicing and operations on it. Very, very handy, very, very fast. Uh, it's not used very much yet, actually, because it's brand new, but it's very slick. All right, so that does it for arrays.